We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Well, good morning, Point family. Great to see you. Glad you're here. Welcome to everybody joining us live online this morning as well. Uh, thank you for spending the morning with us. And what a powerful Sunday we had last Sunday with Pastor Jonathan Falwell, and what a great word he shared with us. And of course, the building reveal, the very first rendition of what our future facility uh, will look like. So we're incredibly excited and thankful uh, for this amazing season that we're in. And today we're wrapping up our series, When God Answers. And I just want to say uh, thank you for two weeks ago, as we were in week two, allowing me to pull back the curtain and share what our journey has looked like over our first seven years as a church and our facility pursuit specifically, and the challenge that has been, and uh, the ups and downs with it, uh, mainly downs, uh, when we got a no, or as we said two weeks ago, when God gave us a something better, and the door was closed. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to pull back the curtain and share my heart as well to be vulnerable with you as your pastor. And thank you for being a safe place for that. Um, thank you for not sending emails like, Pastor, you should have more faith, and what's wrong with you, and things along those lines. Like, I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, we have an amazing church. Like, that's something religious people would do. We don't have any of those here. Um, and so we're so thankful uh, for allowing me to just be honest with you and share my heart. So today I'm going to go another level uh, with that. Okay, is that all right? All right. I'm going to go another level deeper with that. And um, just to be honest with you, uh, uh, even as recently as the month of December, I really began to, as doors were being closed um, throughout the years, I begin to ask the question, like, Lord, am I the one that's supposed to lead us into the promised land, so to speak? Like, God, I don't want to be the one in the way of what you want to do and any door that you want to open for your people. Now, I, I just got to tell you, like, think about stories like Moses and, and Aaron, for example, Numbers 20:12 when the Lord broke the news to them, like, you're not going to be the leaders to lead my people into the promised land. Like, you got to understand, like, we read that verse and we read over it, and we don't think about, like, all the emotional and, 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 and you know, that type of stuff that's involved with it. Like, that's not an easy thing to hear when you're a leader. Or I think of David in, in uh, 2 Samuel 7 when he told Nathan, Nathan, I want to build a temple for the Lord. And Nathan said, go and do what's in your heart. Well, that night, God speaks to Nathan and says, no, you go back and tell David, David, I have always been with you, and I will always be with you, but you're not the one who's going to build the temple. That is something that is reserved for your son. And again, we read over that, and we don't necessarily think about all the emotion uh, behind that kind of a moment. Like, that's a difficult thing for a leader to process. And so I begin to ask, like, Lord, am I in the way of what it is you want to do? Am I in the way of the open door that you have for your people? And I just got to tell you that one of the things that motivates me to grow as your leader is I never want to be the lid on this, on what God wants to do here. Do you hear me? Like, that's why I press into God daily. That's why I study. That's why I want to learn leadership and grow in leadership. I never want to be the lid on what God wants to do here. And so that motivates me in a huge, huge way to grow. But I got to tell you, there were a lot of irrational thoughts that began to cross my mind in the middle of this season of, of, of question. When I think about this, I think about, I shared this a couple of years ago, uh, but uh, a friend that I played b baseball with all growing up in, in high school, great baseball player, and um, he uh, was going through a slump one summer. And so he strikes out in summer ball, and like this is it, like this strikeout is what did him in. He came back to the dugout, took his bat and gloves off, threw him in the trash can, took his bat, threw it in the trash can. I'll never forget the look, look on his face. It was that look of like, this isn't enough. And so he jumps up on the bench and then jumps in the trash can himself. Like when you're going through seasons of doubt, like when, when the stuff is in your mind, like you begin to do things that are irrational and think things that are ir irrational. Now your context may not be me, like leading the church and trying to figure out the land and facility solution, but we've all been in seasons like that before. Like God, can I parent this infant that you've given me? And then, you know, you get through that season, you realize you've survived. Then you, God, I don't know if I can parent this toddler you've given me. 
And then you get through that, and they go straight from the toddler to the teenager. God, I don't know if I can parent this teenager that, that I have. Like, seriously, we have questions like that, right? Or it's like, God, did I hear you wrong in marrying this guy? Like, these irrational thoughts begin to come to our mind. God, was I wrong in getting out of the relationship that, that wasn't honoring to you? And, and should I go back to it? And again, these irrational thoughts begin to come to our mind. On a much more serious note, it may be like, you know, God, was I wrong in leaving that abuse of marriage? No, you weren't wrong in leaving that abuse of marriage. But those irrational thoughts come into mind in those seasons of doubt where, where we question. And every one of us knows what it's like in those types of seasons to have irrational thoughts of that nature. We've all been there before. So here's what God does in Isaiah 55 is he speaks to this Judean community. He says, you're going to find yourself in Babylonian exile in a season where your world is turned upside down and with it you're going to have a lot of questions and there will be irrational thoughts. And remember over the first two weeks of this series as we opened it up, first of all, God probed their heart. Like take for example verse 2. It's not on the screen. But, but just listen to it. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? L listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. In other words, he probes the heart by saying, why are you going to keep going on the same road and expect a different result? Like you keep reaching the same conclusion over and over and over again. Stop trying it your own way. This rhetorical question. So in probing the heart, he then centers the heart. And he says, return to me. For example, verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God. In other words, even more than you need an answer, you need Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the great prize in prayer. So you could get the relationship you've been asking God for, but if you don't get the Lord of the relationship, it's going to ruin you. You can get the marriage that you've always wanted, but if you don't get the one who ordained marriage, then marriage will crush you. You can get the job that you've always wanted, that you've always dreamed of, but if you don't get the giver of that job, then you're going to continue to look to your occupation to try to squeeze meaning out of it that God never intended to bring you fulfillment. For us as a church, we can get our land and we can get our eventual building, but if we don't get the power of God, and if we don't get the one who said, I will build my church, then we're nothing more than a social club. God says, even more than you need an answer, you need me. Jesus says, I am the prize in prayer. So what I want to do now is I want to pick up with verses 8 and 9 as we wrap this up this morning. And in verses 8 and 9, we're going to read through it. This is kind of going to be our, our runway as we get taken off for today. Picking up where we, where we left off last, or two weeks ago. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You won't always understand my activity. You will have questions about how I answer prayer. There will be whys, or why didn't this work out, or why did this happen this way. It's an invitation to look through the why to the who. Verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You won't always understand my activity, but because you get the who behind the answer, you can trust his heart, even when I don't understand. So, with this in mind, we look at verse 10. Now, verse 10 is really an illustration of what's just been said in verses 8 and 9, okay? And it's, it's amazing to me how God chooses to illustrate it. Let's read it, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. He says, For, which means an explanation follows, is the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So let me just tell you what we just read. We just read about the water cycle. With what science calls the water cycle. And here you thought all these years that science and faith contradict. Science and faith don't contradict. Science only serves to affirm what God has already declared in Scripture. And so we read this, and, and he mentions this, this water cycle. So let me be the Norm Sprouse uh, for you this morning, 
or the Clayton Stiver, or for those of you that watch the Newsplex, um, the Travis Koshko, okay? Except the second grade version of them. <laughs> he says, for the rain and the snow, they come down from heaven, and they do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout. So, this amazes me as we read this. The water cycle. Why the water cycle? Why did God bring that in to Isaiah chapter 55 and this invitation to trust him? Th think of it this way. The, the water cycle is just that. It's a cycle. It has no beginning. It has no end. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, and this just fascinates me. So, think about this for a moment. When you think about the water, okay, in the world right now that exists in the world, the same amount of water that existed when God spoke this world into existence is the same amount of water that exists today. Have you ever thought about that? You don't look as impressed as I am. <laughs> water has changed forms over the years, but think about this. Not one molecule of H2O has ever been lost or wasted. Not one molecule of H2O has ever been lost or wasted. Now, what's amazing as we read the, about the water cycle in verse number 10 is this, is that there's no mention of sunshine. Now, we like sunshine. Can I get an amen? amen. Like, you know, amen. I love sunshine. It's funny in the water cycle mentioned here that God only mentions the less desirable elements when it comes to weather patterns, the rain and the snow. Now, I like rain and I like snow, but I don't like days of rain upon days of rain or days of snow upon days of snow, right? Some of you think, I like feet and feet upon snow. Like, well, move to Buffalo, okay? <laughs> and you get all the snow you want up there. For the rest of us, give me an inch or two at a time and we can enjoy and then it's gone in a day, right? Okay, so with this in mind, he mentions the less desirable weather elements as part of the water cycle. We all want sunshine, but God says in order to accomplish my purposes that there's got to be seasons of rain and seasons of snow. There's got to be times when the rain falls. There's got to be times when the snow falls. And it doesn't necessarily make it easy. But what God is saying is that these seasons, these weather patterns are necessary to accomplish my purposes in your life. God says that not one molecule of water falls to this earth without accomplishing its purpose. Which means this, that whatever rain or whatever snow is falling upon your life right now, it is falling with purpose. God is saying through this passage that there is a purpose in your pain. There is a method to the madness you are going through. That there is a more fully developed and functional faith that is being formed in your heart as a result of the weather pattern that you're experiencing in your life. God says, I waste nothing that falls upon your life. Nothing. You see, if you look at this verse with me, it says that, that the rain and the snow, they come down from heaven. And it says, and they don't return there without watering the earth. And it says, and making it bare and sprout. Now, the Hebrew behind this is just simply the image of what you see happening on trees this time of year. Have you, you probably have been too busy to notice this. But if you go this today, sometime, go up to one of the trees in your yard and look at the tips of the branches. What's forming on those tips? It's these little buds that are forming. On Friday, uh, Carrie took our two oldest girls to the movies, and I had little Ella at home. The plan was for her to take a nap and for me to take a nap. <laughs> and that nap lasted about 15 minutes. But I had little Ella out in our front yard on my shoulders, and we were walking through the front yard. And I hadn't noticed this until now, but I walk up close to one of the maples in our front yard. I get up close, and she wants to grab the tip of the branch, and she sees something forming. You know what that is forming? It's a sign of life. It's life that's forming. You see, God says that the rain and snow that fall, they fall for the purpose of producing a life, giving faith in your heart and in your life, that it would bear fruit, that it would sprout out. 
Not one molecule of water that falls to the earth falls wasted. Not one molecule is lost. God is using it to accomplish his purpose of producing life-giving faith in us. God says you're going to find yourself in seasons of doubt, in seasons where you have to trust, which, by the way, I don't know what it is about it, and I put myself in this category as well. Like, it's like after a time period of following Jesus, like, we know we're saved by faith, we walk a little bit while by faith. At some point in time, I don't know what happens in our growth, but we just feel entitled to just thinking, like, well, God, I, like, I've been walking with you, I don't have to walk by faith anymore. Like, since when is that, you know, ever happened? It'll never happen. There will never be a season in this life where we will be exempt from walking by faith and walking in faith. And so because of that, God is saying what I'm sending is being sent for the purpose of creating a faith that has depth and has substance in your heart and in your life. Something that's life-giving, that can bear and sprout And then look at this, this function to this. It says, in furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Seed to the sower and and bread to the eater. It's the kind of faith that we learn that even though we don't understand the answer, even though we don't understand his activity, we've learned to trust his heart and know that whatever weather pattern I find myself in, that God is using this season to accomplish great purpose in my life. I want to read this to you from Song of Solomon 416. It's on the screen. Just listen to this a moment. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. Listen to this. Awake, O north wind. You know what Solomon is saying? Is I have reached the point in following God and maturity and growth that I can say to God with complete confidence in him, Lord, send the north wind. The north wind being the most violent of winds. And we can do that because we know the one who sends the north winds. We can know and we can trust that whatever God allows to come our way, he's using it to create maturity in us. Now, maturity is a funny thing. It's something that we think about and we wish people around us had more of, right? (laughs) We don't like to think about maturity in our own lives and the growth that needs to happen in our own lives. But God, bring it on, right, for other people. We, we all want maturity. What we don't want is we don't want the process it takes to get us mature. And so we look back at verse number 11. Now, after this weather pattern, water cycle illustration, he then goes back to teaching. The Lord says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to be empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God says not one word of mine ever gets wasted. Every word of mine that goes forth into your life, it will land in the soil of your life and it will go down deep into the crevices of your heart and it will do a work in you It will grow you, and it will mature you, and it will take you through a process that even at times will be painful. It will require water and rain and snow and occasional sunshine. But God has promised that with his word, he will accomplish his purposes. Not one word gets wasted. You know what this is? It's a picture of maturity. And it's an invitation in Isaiah 55, this invitation to trust God. It's this invitation to exchange a life that's governed by the authority of your feelings for a life that's governed by the authority of the word of God. Let me say that again. This invitation to trust God is an invitation to exchange a life that's governed by the authority of your feelings for a life that's governed by the authority of the word of God. For so many of us, the weather patterns of life, they crush us, they do us in. Why? Because we're governed by the authority of feeling. 
God says, when you exchange the govern of the authority of your feeling for the authority of my word, it's then that my word begins to accomplish purpose and come to fruition in your life, to bear life in you, a life-giving faith, a faith that has substance, a faith that has depth. You know, um, I read this, and I couldn't help but think of what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, you're, you're a babe in Christ. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow in respect to your salvation. He says at the end of 2 Peter 3, 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, growth, maturity, isn't optional for a follower of Jesus. It's not. Years ago, we used to host uh, student life in our home, our little uh, town home there on Pantops. And, and I think back to those days and just how fun they were uh, for Carrie and I. And every Wednesday night, we would open our doors to our students and all the middle school students and all the high school students. They would pile into our town home, all the student life leaders. And we were shoulder to shoulder in that little town home. And pizza, you know, toppings all over the floor and uh cake and crumbs all over the floor and cupcakes and cookies and I mean it was it was just an absolute uh, mess it was chaos but it was so much fun and so um, in the middle of all that mix was our little daughter Cana our first daughter now you you know for those of you that are parents you remember what it's like with your first daughter right like you're paranoid or your first child you're paranoid about everything and so um, I, I think back to those times Carrie you remember we used to carry um, you remember we used to carry pacifier wipes Pacifier wipes. <laughs> pacifier wipes, of all things. And you know, the pacifier for your first child, it hits the floor and you pull out the pacifier wipe. It, it couldn't be a regular wipe, it has to be a pacifier wipe. And you wipe it off and you make sure it's clean. Or if you don't have one, you rush to the sink and you wash that thing off in soap and water. And it, I'm telling you, boil it before you put it back in your child's <laughs> mouth. And then your second and third come along, that pacifier hits the floor, what do you do? You pick it up and you clean it off in your mouth <laughs> and you pop it right into theirs. You know, your first one like only gets the best, right? <laughs> only the best. The best food, the best, I mean the best of everything, your first one. Only gets the best. Well, I'll never forget, um, you know, it was fun because the, the girls, the middle school and high school girls loved her. And so the high school girls, they would hold her and, you know, trade her off and hold her and trade her off. And every so often, a middle school kid would get a hold of her and we'd have to go rescue her. And um, <laughs> I'll never forget the night, the horror, okay, the horror that I felt. When I look across the room and there's our sweet Cana and she's chewing on something. I go over quickly. And I, you know, do the little hook thing to figure out what's in her mouth. And one of the middle schoolers had just fed our daughter pizza. <laughs> now, up until this point, she'd only ever had milk, okay? <laughs> our first daughter went from milk <laughs> to pizza. Her system couldn't handle it. Are you with me? Couldn't handle it. Like there's a, a step or two in between the two of those, right? <laughs> she eventually got there. Listen, wh what you're going through right now, it feels hard. It can feel harsh. The wind can blow hard at times. The rain can feel like a lot. The snow can be intense. But let me just tell you that God is working a process in you. We're all a work in process, and what you're going through is not the first thing, and it will not be the last thing. We're a work in process. Look to your neighbor, tell him I'm a work in process. Look to your other neighbor, tell him you're a work in process. That was funny. That was a lot louder than the first one. God says, not one word that goes forth will be wasted. And God has given us this invitation, this invitation to trust, this invitation to exchange the authority of our feelings for the authority of the word of God. And what you find is this, 
is this produces a faith in you. It develops a faith in you that is fully functional, that's not just life-giving in and of yourself, but it's life-giving to others. God is working a work. He is at work in the process that you find yourself in, regardless of what weather pattern you're facing. Now, look at this growth here, okay? Look, look at the growth. If you look at verse 12, here's what God says to us. He says, trust my process, trust my heart. You might not always understand what you're going through. And he says this in verse 12. For you will go out with joy, underline that, joy, and you will be led forth with, what? With peace, underline that, joy and peace. I wrote in the margin of my Bible that these two things before were strictly circumstantial. Joy and peace meaning they hinge on the right weather pattern. Sunshine, joy and peace. A little snow, joy and peace. A little bit of rain, joy and peace. But the days upon days and upon days of rain, which we're all going to experience at some point in time or another, the feet upon feet upon feet of snow, he says that you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. They're no longer circumstantial because you've grown and because you've matured and because you have learned to trust the heart of God even when you don't understand his activity. And look at this, this is beautiful. The mountains and the hills will break forth and the shouts of joy before you and the trees of the field will clap their hands. And it's not that the mountains and the hills and the trees didn't do this before. It's just that your faith wasn't mature enough to see it. It's funny how when you go through a season, you come out the other side, how, how much you have such a greater level of clarity and perspective. Are you with me? Like, this is what God wants to create in you, a perspective that's heavenly, a new perspective that you have, or even better said, a, a new perspective that has you, a much more mature perspective. I think about this in relation to what I shared with you in the beginning of this morning, and just kind of the questions and the doubts. God, am, am I the one that's like supposed to lead us into the next season? And asking God that just simply because like we didn't get a yes yet. And how shaken my confidence was, and what I know that God had called us to, but just shake it. And these irrational thoughts that would come with that. I'm telling you, I need your prayer. Carrie and I need your prayers. So I think about it, and then one day it just hits me in the middle of all of it. It's like, Gabe, the Lord's saying, your confidence is shaken because you haven't got a yes yet. Wake up and look around at all I'm doing. And I'm aware, but wasn't aware. Had a perspective to a degree, but the perspective didn't have me. You know, our first five years of the, of the point have been extraordinary. And, and I just want to say this. I hope you never, or we never, take this for granted, what God is doing. I hope we never take it for granted because what is happening here is not normal. I hope you realize that. It is not normal. It's extraordinary. And I think about our first five years, how amazing they have been, but then it even hits me like the last two years have been unbelievable. Like if the first five were like extraordinary, like the last two have been supernatural. In fact, it even hit me last week when Pastor Jonathan was here and I had a chance to introduce him to many of you. It was incredible because it was just like, Pastor Jonathan, who you just met, like God put their marriage back together a couple years ago. Pastor, God put that marriage back together a few, a few months ago. Like, and it was like story after story. And I'm like, holy cow, look at all that God is doing. Pastor Jonathan, that man that you just met, he hadn't been in church in 35 years until he came to the point. And he can't get enough of it. I'm like, are you kidding me? And it's like, 
I knew it, but I didn't. I saw it, but I didn't see it. You know, it takes some maturity to see through the answer that you want to the one who gives the answer. And this is what God is saying. Like, I want to grow you. I want to give you something with substance. I want to develop a mature faith in you. I want to develop a life-giving faith in you. You're going to have questions. You're going to be required to walk by faith and live by faith. And God says the weather pattern that you're in, I, I promise you, not one drop of H2O is ever going to be wasted. Not one word that goes forth will return without accomplishing the purpose I sent it for. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills will break forth and the shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Listen, it, it was even a point where a few months back that Carrie and I were having dinner with one of our overseers, Pastor Daniel Floyd and his wife Tammy. And Pastor Daniel is my pastor. Every pastor needs a pastor. He was my pastor. We had dinner one night at their home. And he said, you know, of course, how are things going? And we began to talk through the dynamic of, of just waiting on God for an open door with a land, with facility. And he had been aware of it over the years. But, but you know, he really pressed in, like, how's, how's it going? And some of you think, I know what some of you think, you're making a big deal out of, like, hey, this, this is a great facility. Just stay here for the rest of your life. If it were only that simple, okay? We can't stay here forever, all right? The school has already been so gracious to us and have been so amazing to us. And so this can't be our permanent home. And so this, this constant weight has kind of been there, and this burden has been there. And I told him that night, before I'd only shared it with Carrie, and I told him that night, I said, you know, it's really even caused me to question and shaking my confidence. And, and, and are we the ones that lead us into the next season? And he said, Gabe, he said, he said, don't you doubt in the valley what God has revealed on the mountaintop. And then he said this, he said, I have seen this so many times. And he said, I want you to take this to heart. The greater the struggle, the greater the breakthrough. The greater the struggle, the greater the breakthrough. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but I want to encourage you. The more intense the rain, the more beautiful the spring will be. The more snow you get in the winter, the more beautiful the flowers are in the springtime. That whatever weather pattern you find yourself in, whatever struggle it is, God is using it to accomplish something beautiful in your life. And there will be a day when you will look back as hard as it is to imagine it now. And you will look back on the season that you find yourself in. And you wouldn't trade what God accomplished in you for the world because of the weather. Look, a few verses and I'm closing. Listen to this, just listen. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking in nothing. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, for your growth, for your maturity, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. The greater the struggle, the greater the breakthrough. So in mid to late December, after the most recent of the facility pursuits had fallen through, the one that I shared with you a few weeks ago, Pastor Nate came to my office and said, it, it's not good. And, you know, he left and then I sunk to my knees and laid there on the floor for I don't know how long. In the middle of kind of recovering from that, I was invited to lunch on Pantops by one of my closest friends and biggest encouragers here at the point. And he invited me there for lunch for a specific purpose. He's a developer in the area. And following lunch, he said, Gabe, he said, before we leave here, I want to show you something. There's a reason I want to have lunch here. And so we walk out of Kabuto, the, their own pan tops, beside sticks. And he said, he said, let's take a left right here. And so we take a left, and we walk down the sidewalk. 
We cross over the little road that runs around behind the shopping center. And then we stand on the hillside. And he said, what do you think? And in that moment, I really saw for the very first time the land that we currently have under contract. Now, let me tell you, I've seen that land I don't know how many times over the years. But this time I saw it through the lens of a new fully formed faith in me. I saw it not with just a good, clear perspective, but a perspective that now had me. I had seen and passed it, I don't know how many times, but I just, I don't know how to describe it. That day I saw it in a brand new light. And when I laid my eyes on that view, it took my breath away. When I looked out over the city, it took my breath away. And every time I go there now, and I hope every time you go by there to pray or to visit, I hope it takes your breath away to see what God has done, to see how God has answered to see why over the years we got something better, something better, something better, something better, something better. Now we see. Isaiah 55, listen to this again. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. What you're waiting on is coming. What you're trusting God for is on the way. Some of you have asked, well, what if I've messed up? What if I've gotten ahead of God? What if I've screwed it up and, and, and I don't know how to backtrack? Listen, today's the day to return to Him. Stop trying to sort it out. Stop trying to come up with an answer. It's to return to Him. The who behind the one who answers prayer. And I can promise you this, that whatever weather you're facing right now, that God wants to reach into it and He wants to redeem it. He wants to turn it around and He wants to use it for His glory. And for those of you that have been waiting and waiting and waiting, don't give up. Your breakthrough could come at any moment. At any moment, the clouds could part. The sunshine could break through. But just remember, the greater the struggle, the greater the breakthrough. Let's pray. Thank you for this time you've given us in your word today, Jesus. Thank you for your word, for the power and the truth of your word. And God, this morning, my confidence is fully in your word. And God, I pray this morning for any heart that's here whose faith is shaken. It's being shaken to the core and it's causing them to think irrationally and to question did they hear you? Did they make the right step? Did they make the right decision? God, strengthen their faith this morning. Develop a faith, God, in them that's fully formed and functional, that has depth, that has purpose. God, I pray that even right now, as they don't understand your activity, help them to trust your heart. And God, I pray especially for the heart that's here that's never trusted you as Lord and Savior. May today be the day that they cross this line from death into life, into faith in you for the very first time, to this brand new relationship and following Jesus Christ. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed and everybody's very still and quiet for just a moment. If you're here today, you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, today I want to give you that opportunity to step from death into life, to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sin, for a brand new life and a brand new start. And if that's you today, I want to invite you to pray with me. I want to ask you to pray out loud. And I want to ask that we all pray out loud with you in support of you who are making this decision for the first time. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. And give me the strength to live for you from this day forward, in Jesus' name.